And I'm joined today by my friend and colleague, Kara. Hi, everyone. My name is Kara, and I'm excited for today. You're going to hear a lot of really wonderful advice from Marin about portfolio tips. And I'm going to be in the background. I'm going to answer some of your questions through text, through the Q&A tab. So if you look down at your screen right now, you see a Q&A button. Click on that for all of your questions. Any mm -hmm. questions that go in the chat, we might not be able to see or get to on time. So put them all in the Q&A. Um, and then at the very end, I'm going to hoard some and we're going to answer them live with Marin. So yeah. I'll see you all soon. Excellent. And yes, my, and I didn't even introduce myself. Uh, my name is Marin Brennan. I work in admissions. Um, I also went to RISD as a student. Kara and I both went to graduated from illustration and graduated different years. We didn't overlap, unfortunately, as students, but um, we know what it's like to be a student at RISD and to make portfolios for RISD. So we're going to dive in now that the um, attendees have leveled out. So Kara, if you could just let me know if you can see my screen. It looks great. Excellent. All right. And I'm going to also... Um, Stop my video so that you won't be distracted um, and you can focus on the presentation. So, okay, okay, wonderful. So thank you again, everyone for being here, no matter where you're tuning in from, what time zone. Um, and you are probably here today because you're considering art schools or programs, and that's really fantastic. And the most important part of your application to almost any art school will be your portfolio. So the really broad definition of a portfolio is a collection of examples that showcases your thinking and making in your creative practice. But the portfolio you put together for your RISD application has additional specifications and parameters. All art schools have different portfolio requirements and look for different things. So in this presentation, I'm going to go in depth about what RISD looks for in a portfolio and kind of really more, more specifically how to get started when creating your portfolio. So the first thing I recommend doing is to self-evaluate your artwork. So you know, we are all prone to patterns, whether we mean to or not. We kind of have a tendency to gravitate maybe towards the same subject matter or um, work with the same mediums. You know, we we tend to do things consistently, whether they, we mean to or not. Maybe it, we just uh, find ourselves recreating the same composition. So I recommend looking over work that you've done you know, recently within the last couple of years, write a list of things that you, that are, you know, similar elements in your work and then practice restrictions and limitations by avoiding any of the items on the list in your next few pieces, just to see what you can come up with to really step outside the box. Um, so for example, this person mixed, you know, things up by painting quote unquote with thread. So they, I think were inspired by watercolor paintings that they did loose, kind of abstract watercolor paintings and then um, created these textile panels uh, to mimic those paintings. I also encourage you to experiment with using unconventional materials in a new way. So this kind of like demon creature on the left is made out of jeans and corduroy. Um, I can see all, all different types of material in the, um, in the piece on the right and almost just feels like a, a coral reef made of, of different like plastics and um, I'm not even sure what. So you can definitely play with unconventional materials in such a way where you can't even identify the material that you're using. Now also think about, you know, when you get a class assignment, which many of you I'm sure are in um, an art programs at school or maybe outside of school, you're going to get assignments and think about how you can personalize it. Anything, any assignment you're given, think about ways in which you can really make it your own, take the prompt and run with it. So say that you're, you're assigned uh, a landscape. Now, who's to say that your depiction can't be done in fabric like you see here? Try also mixing mediums or even mixing 2D with 3D. So these pieces have a, a really cool combination of two-dimensional elements um, and three-dimensional elements kind of um, protruding from them or like seamlessly uh, incorporated in, in the piece itself. Also, I encourage you to, to make 2D work that has a 3D feel to it. So this textile, it has 
you know, this, this kind of like mountainous landscape and there's something about it that has a, a, a feeling where it's like coming out towards you. Um, and there might be some 3D element to it as well, but just like, you know, experimenting with depth and um, perspective and making if the viewer feel like it, they can just sink into the space. Now, it's also good to start by uh, making as much art as you can and as often as possible. So the more art you make, the more ideas you get and the more your work develops. Now, one method is to work in a series. In other words, after you make a piece, continue the theme in another piece, whether that's an idea or a method or material, keep building off of the pieces you've already made. Um, as I mentioned before, sometimes having a constraint or, or limits can help you experiment more. Here's a series of necklaces all made out of fibers, but within those limitations, there is a wide variety. Another great method, especially for design, is to make multiples. Take your idea and express it in different ways across multiple iterations. Oftentimes, while you are making the first piece, you will think of sophisticated ideas that can be your second piece. Especially for product design and architecture, you want to work out all the possibilities of a design for a specific problem or location. Take Cara DiPaolo's many iterations of salt and pepper shakers, for instance. Um, and I'm not quite sure where those salt and pepper shakers went, but oh, ho, ho, there they are. I had to click on it again. I was going to say, I was like, you guys, you don't want to miss out on these. They're so cool. So never mind. There they are. But yes, yeah, see, as you can see, there's a whole number of different items. And you would think, oh, salt and pepper shaker, that's just run of the mill um, kitchenware. But clearly there's so many directions you can go in um, if you just give it some thought. You know, don't cut a good idea short. Keep working out the different possibilities of an idea. Let your ideas grow in different directions. Follow tangents like this Julie Maritou poster series by Ann Lee in graphic design. Of course, making multiples is also a wonderful idea for fine arts too. A common assignment in EFS is making a series of 50 pieces centered around one idea. This student focused on teeth. And uh, here's some close-ups of her series on teeth. Uh, this is a sleep series, 50 series. Look at the variety of approaches. Again, that's the benefit of having one constant that you keep coming at from different angles. And that's certainly something that you learn at RISD. You learn how to nurture ideas. You learn how to approach things from many different angles and you realize that there's not just one way to get from point A to point B. You can also explore the buildings around Providence at night. Providence is riddled with story and history and has a lot of character um, all around you. And it doesn't have to be a 50 series. Maybe you choose a format that needs to be a series like making a tarot deck or maybe an illustrated calendar. You can also use the format of a storyboard uh, or a comic to play with drawing. You can make up your own story or even bring your own point of view to an existing story. Here um, is Luke's take on Little Red Riding Hood. The graphic shapes and almost like tapestries and patterns here um, really run through and kind of connect and get the viewer's eye moving around, which I really love. I love that vibrant red as well. Another tip about where to start, I recommend drawing from observation as much as possible. So working from observation means that you look at the spaces around you, the objects and the people right in front of you. You can have surprisingly interesting pieces come from just drawing what's around you. A sink full of dirty dishes is a great subject matter. A lot of clutter is really exciting to see, seeing how the different objects interact with each other. Um, and these are three drawings of the same hanging house plan. Again, approaching it from many different ways and, and, and angles. Ferns and dying cilantro plants. That certainly makes a really good subject matter. Again, you can make surprisingly interesting um, and meaningful pieces by drawing what's already around you. Tara made a series of drawing piles of random clutter in her parents' house. And for Tara, these depictions of clutter became a metaphor for her strained, complicated relationship with her mother. Now, one thing that's always around is your face. Self-portraits can be a great jumping off point. Consider the background. Maybe that adds to the story. 
Also self-portraits can be a good warm up. Now with my own work, I feel if I feel rusty or if I don't quite know what to make next, I'll start by doing a self-portrait to get warmed up. Um, it's helpful to think about what art you're going to make um, as you're working on something. Get in the zone and that's when more ideas will come. And there's a whole world outside your window as well and plenty of inspiration. So you can even use the reflection in the window as your muse, like uh, Remy did. A series of photographs of the windows of College Hill in Providence. This is, uh, this is the series of photographs and they're touching on the sensation of estrangement and growing pains that come with leaving home and, and striking out on your own. And that kind of reminds me of that when you're taking walks at night and you're just kind of like unwinding from the day and you're looking around and you happen to see, you know, windows um, where the lights are turned on inside and you kind of get a get a very quick, small glimpse of someone's life. So maybe you can see what they're watching on TV or you can see them eating at the dinner table and you're not creepy about it. You just, <laughs> you just are observing and, and taking the world in as an artist does, as a curious individual does. Uh, you can also, of course, set up your own still life. Think about what objects and materials you can use. Maybe you can uh, have a person pose for you, maybe a family family member or friend. And certainly a still life, you know, doesn't have to be stilted or boring. It doesn't have to just be, you know, a fruit in a bowl on a table, uh, which can be interesting too. You can really, again, make it your own, um, have a lot of personality to the, to the pieces that you're choosing uh, in your still life. You can create a wax sculpture setup. So this is a drawing, or excuse me, a painting uh, and a drawing based on the, the wax sculpture from before. So you can really pull from your own models. I'll often suggest students who work a lot in three-dimensional, with three-dimensional pieces, I suggest, you know, shining a, an interesting light on their their 3D work and making drawings or paintings from those. See what happens, it could be abstract as well. Now, direct observation doesn't just have to be drawings. You can sculpt from observation as well. The student on the left is working with clay to replicate this human skull. And on the right, the student is making a sculpture of a horseshoe crab out of bristle board. In general, and especially if you're working in 3D, try not to draw from photos. It usually leads to flattened, uh, distorted outcomes. It's really hard to not make your depiction look flat if you're working from a flat resource. Now there's no need to wait for a class to start making art. You can certainly make your own schedule where you set aside time to devote to art and design making. I know a lot of artists or writers will do this, will have like a routine. It's always helpful to kind of have a set schedule where you, you schedule time in, you pencil it, in, it into your agenda to maybe it's two, three hours where, you know, um, uninterrupted art making time. And, and it's a regular thing that you go back to. Now, if you find the structure and deadlines of a class helpful, as I do, I certainly do, you may want to consider taking an online art class through an art school over the summer. Now, another option are RISD pre-college programs. You can spend your summer at RISD um, in a, in a um, six-week summer program where you live on RISD's campus in the dorm rooms where our freshmen live uh, during the school year. You get a, a real sense of our intensive program. Plus, you'll get a chance to make art that you'll want to include in your portfolio. Now, if you can't make it over the summer, we do also offer advanced program online, which are online classes all year round. And again, another opportunity to make great work um, that you might want to include in your portfolio. Now, of course, a pre-college program um, or, um, you know, online classes or any outside classes are not required at all. By any means, we know that our applicants have um, access to different resources. So certainly not a requirement, but it's just a, a great way to get to know the school you're interested in and to um, another opportunity to make great work for your portfolio. Uh, you can also start with ACAD. Um, here's their website. Um, using that top search bar where it says browse, you can use filters to find top art schools all over North America. You can find some are online classes that are different time commitments, different costs, et cetera. Um, so as you can see, the ACAD is the Association of Independent Colleges of Art and Design. So you can learn all about these different schools on this site as well. Um, now I don't, I recommend that you don't wait until school starts to make art. Um, 
you know, it's certainly a good idea to take art classes. Uh, if your school doesn't offer the classes you like, schedule time to make art, as I said before. Um, but and and again, look into the different schools that you're interested in because as I as I talked about earlier, um, there are a lot of similarities between the different ACAD schools, but there's also a lot of differences. So just making sure that you're kind of keeping in mind the different things that they're going to want to see in your portfolio um, when you're making work. Now, one great way to start as well is by keeping a sketchbook. So this is a great place to jot down ideas, plan out pieces, or maybe draw from what's around you. Also, it's more private, so you can make mistakes or make work that isn't perfect. And it allows you to experiment. Try to do at least one page in your sketchbook every day, whether that's writing notes or jotting down quick sketches. So I'm not gonna show too many images of sketchbook pages because I don't wanna give the false impression that there's one right way to keep a sketchbook. Also, it's impossible, uh, it's, excuse me, possible that keeping a sketchbook can be really helpful to your process, um, but not be um, impressive in and of itself. And that's still great. It doesn't have to show up in your portfolio. So again, the sketchbook is like gives you free reign to just test out ideas. It doesn't in any way have to be portfolio ready or portfolio worthy. Um, it's just a part of your process. Uh, there's all different sketchbooks out there, Spiral Ground, Accordion, Bound Like a Book, all different papers. You can even build your own sketchbook so it's the exact size of materials you like best. And re remember, sketchbooks are helpful for all disciplines, industrial design, architecture, uh, digital animation. It's a great place to keep ideas and plan. And it's really awesome. If you're going um, on vacation over the summer, definitely take your sketchbook with you and just document the different amazing places where you are. Really get a sense of the environment. Also get in the habit of taking your sketchbook everywhere and documenting people, quote unquote, in the wild um, to practice depicting nuance and gesture and body language. You know, maybe how a person's choice of clothing or hairstyle might tell you something about them. And you can collect this information for your own work in the future, you know, whether or not you're interested in illustration or animation, but just kind of gathering information from what you see around you that you can use as inspiration and ideas for later on. Now, some of your best work might end up living in your sketchbook, but to start, the sketchbook is a great place for stream of conscious ideas for you to expand upon outside of your sketchbook. I also recommend looking at as much art as possible, preferably in person. Take a trip to a museum or gallery near you. Uh, we have a great RISD museum. I, uh, if you ever get a chance to visit our campus, um, definitely stop by the RISD museum. It's really exquisite. Um, you know, galleries are usually free to visit, so look up galleries near you. It's always best to see art in person. Um, and looking at and making drawings of other people's work is a great way to get ideas for your own pieces. And I recommend that more as a process to learn um, for yourself and to get ideas again for what you want to try out. I wouldn't recommend when it comes time to choose pieces for your portfolio to submit to RISD and other schools. I wouldn't recommend including uh, master copies where you're doing a, rep um, a replica of an existing work of art. That's really more just for you and your skill set. Um, we want to see your original work in your portfolio. So a Google search always works great, but here's another way to look for museums, galleries, or art spaces near you. Art Cyclopedia. So you can see art museums worldwide. Now again, looking at art in person is better, um, but most museums like the Riz Museum have images of their collections on their websites. And it's also great to follow museums or galleries on Instagram. Uh, one of my personal favorites is the Met, um, but you can do any. Remember, looking at art online does not replace the experience of looking at art and design in person. So I can't say it enough, but if you get a chance to, to see artwork um, in the flesh, it's really, a, um, it's a just completely arresting experience. Um, online art magazines are also a great way to learn about current artwork. Wonderful general art and design online magazines. Um, Hyperallergic is one of them. Also juxtapose is a more of a graphic design and illustration slant. You have a great online magazine geared towards graphic design. 
This is an animation magazine. This one's about architecture. Architecture and design. This is a great online magazine where artists interview other artists. So many great resources out there. I recommend Googling your area of interest and looking for, for online magazines and that there's a lot more than you can ever imagine out there. Now, every artist is different and will find inspiration in different places. You don't have to be inspired by other art or design pieces. And if you're not sure what consistently inspires you yet, that's okay. Just start being open to inspiration coming from unexpected places. And that's where another great place where your sketchbook comes in. You never know where an idea is gonna strike. So you're gonna wanna have something on hand where you can jot down or, or sketch out an idea as it comes to you. Now here's a quote from filmmaker Jim Jarmusch, uh, steal from anywhere that resonates with inspiration or fuels your imagination, devour old films, new films, music, books, paintings, photographs, poems, dreams, random conversations, architecture, bridges, street signs, trees, clouds, body of water, light and shadows. So again, just be on the lookout and open to finding inspiration around you. You really never know when it's gonna strike. So Tinker Hatfield uh, is an architect turned shoe designer for Nike, drew inspiration from controversial building he walked by while in Paris, Centre Georges Pompidou. This building took all its functional and structural elements and placed them on the outside for all to see. Um, many actually consider this building an eyesore, but this exposed structure inspired Hatfield to reveal the air pouch Air Max One. That looks like a very, very comfortable shoe. And I definitely can see the inspiration from this building. Uh, Juicy Salif by Philippe um, Stark, a citrus squeezer. This squid-like design was inspired by a meal of squid and lim lemon he ate. So while eating, Stark um, jotted down his idea on a napkin and mailed it off to the Alessi Housewares and Utensils Company for approval. Sahana draws from mythology throughout her work, specifically Buddhist and Hindu mythology. Recently, Sahana has gotten into um, Muay Thai and was able to travel to Thailand for uh, to train. Uh, Sahana observed that um, that this in Thailand is a, a a confluence of mythology, spectacle, sport, aggression, playfulness, and so much more. There's a heavy presence of superstition and tradition even superstition surrounding the bodies of women. Also the grueling process of training reveals the range and depth of emotion, relationships, and mental toughness. In this spot, um, in this sport, we are made by the things that oppose us, incarnations of the twisting snakes. Now, um, it's a, definitely a good idea to let yourself make mistakes. You know, making quote unquote bad art is all part of the process. So don't be afraid of making mistakes or bad art. You definitely will. And it's just, just everybody does. You got to get the bad drawings or sculptures out before the good stuff comes out. Um, it's necessary and it's inevitable. Stumbles are totally normal. Progress, not perfection, is what we should be asking of ourselves. A failed piece may be a necessary stepping stone to your next work. Art matures and requires ugly duckling growth stages. So this is a quote by Scott Adams, illustrator and cartoonist. Um, creativity is allowing yourself to make mistakes. Art is knowing which ones to keep. So oftentimes failed pieces tend to lead to stronger ideas. So start making and try to let go of the fear of being wrong. Um, and then show up, show up, show up. And after a while, the muse shows up too. If she doesn't show up invited, eventually she just shows up. So that is Isabel Allen. And um, that's a great quote just to say, keep at it. You know, it's not always going to be easy. And some days are going to feel like you've made no progress, but just by working at it, you are making progress. Um, you know, I, I, I take this quote also to mean, don't wait for inspiration to smack you in the face, move your hands, touch materials, make stuff. And that will lead you to inspiration and ideas. Um, just to continue with some inspiring quotes, you know, Pablo Picasso said, inspiration exists, but it has to find you working. Um, and Chuck Close said, inspiration is for amateurs. The rest of us just show up and get to work. So definitely keep at it. 
Uh, now, I also encourage you to check out past videos that we have. We have many other portfolio tip webinar recordings on our YouTube channel. And this is this is where this recording will be posted. Um, we have other application prep um, info sessions. Uh, so I encourage you to check those out and there'll be more to come um, in the future. And it's also a really wonderful idea to get feedback on your artwork. Um, and our next online portfolio day, which takes place on Zoom is May 9th. Um, and that is the online portfolio days are always from 4 to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So um, that is not yet. I, I don't believe that is on our website yet, um, but the registration will open um, next month. So just keep an eye on that. You get 15 minutes with a RISD representative. And you just again, it's purely for feedback, just so you can get some um some thoughts on where to go with your portfolio. When it gets closer to when you're submitting your work, you can get great thoughts on what to leave in, what to what to take out. And I want to encourage you to make now, curate later. So, you know, maybe you're listening to this advice and thinking, yeah, right. But, uh, you know, it's necessary to make more pieces than you expect to put in your portfolio. You know, you want to give yourself options. So certainly, you know, editing is important, but don't worry about that now. Just make work, have fun with it and see what happens. Um, and I know making a portfolio may seem like a monumental task. You know, just start with making as much work as you can. Don't worry if it's portfolio worthy just yet. Then decide what pieces will go in your por portfolio closer to the deadline. Um, again, we'll have more webinars in the fall uh, that speak to more to what pieces to choose for your portfolio. So for the summer, just have fun, make work, and, and just again, take the information that you're learning about the various schools and what we're looking for in a portfolio, um, and then kind of put it somewhere where you can return back to, but then don't let that be at the forefront of your mind. Just allow yourself to make mistakes, experiment, try new things, and just know that RISD is looking for you and we wanna see your personality and your point of view and your work. So definitely don't be afraid to step outside the box, try new things and show us what you love and, and who you are as an artist and an individual. So um, I'm gonna open it up to questions now, but I just wanted to uh, um, thank you all very much for being here. And please know that our admissions at rizu.edu email address is a great way to contact us. You can also give us a call. Um, if you get a chance to visit our campus, you can register for tours um, on our website. So um, I'm going to stop sharing and now open it up to questions. Marin, hi everybody. Hey. Um, so we had only a couple que questions come through. If anyone has any more questions, please put them into the Q and A. Um, I know that sometimes it's hard to write questions when you're so intently listening to the presentation, so that does make sense. Um, but the first question is a really good one, and mm -hmm. that is, how do you balance making multiples and doing series with the idea of getting stuck in your patterns? So I guess, how do you not get stuck in your patterns? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, and a great question, excuse me. So I think that you can still have like a series of work, but there's a common thread with them, um, whether it be a narrative, you know, that's just, you know, it's following a story or, um, or same, a similar character, or there's a similar color palette, but I think you can still have consistency and like a series, but also there being variety within that. So I think that's an excellent question. And it does feel a little bit contradictory. Um, meaning like what I had said about like, don't fall into your patterns, but also you might want to like work on a series. I think both can exist at the same time. Um, but also you can also experiment with having a series where there's a lot of similar elements within a series too, to keep it interesting. You're, there's, you're going to want there to be differences, certainly, but something that ties them together. Um, and, but then also branching outside of that series and, and trying something completely different with your next series or the next few pieces that you do, if that makes sense. So I think there can still be differences even when they, there are pieces that go together. On the subject of series, though, I just thought of it. I just want you all to know as well that when it comes to the RISD portfolio, you don't have to have a theme to your work, what you decide to include. There doesn't have to be a through line in anything that you can include um, series in your portfolio, but also make sure to leave room for other pieces that show us variety as well, a variety of ideas and, and mediums and techniques. 
Great answer. Um, wonderful. So what is a good amount to have for your portfolio? So when it comes to Rizzi's portfolio, it's going to be 12 to 20 examples of your best and most recent work. So work that we've done within the last couple of years. If you're applying as a first year applicant, and I believe everybody here is interested in applying as a first year, um, but I'll speak to transfers as well, just in case you are applying to experimental and foundation studies. So I, um, we have other online info sessions um, and in-person info sessions that speak to what that is. Uh, but basically the first year at RISD is you're taking drawing, design, spatial dynamics. So you don't have to have examples of all three in your portfolio, but you're really gonna wanna show us your foundational skills, your techniques, always your ideas and your concepts, rather than saying like, oh, well, I know I wanna go into animation and then sending us a portfolio that really is only directed towards film animation video. Um, as a first year, you're not applying to a major. So if you're applying as a transfer, then you would be applying to a particular department. So your body of work should feel like it's catered toward that major, um, but still 12 to 20 pieces. And you're also welcome to include other disciplines and, and some foundational work. Um, but I also always like to point out, like, it's a better idea to have 12, like, let's say 12 or 13 really strong pieces and stop there rather than having 12 or 13 really strong pieces and then throwing in seven or eight filler pieces just to um, just to get to 20. You know, more isn't necessarily better. Um, it is important to edit. So anywhere within 12 to 20 examples of work. Great, thank you. Um, if I'm an illustrative artist, what is a good way to transition into a more sculpture or textural art? Sure, I mean, definitely, it was, well, with illustration too, and there's luckily with that realm, it's like there's it's such a wide umbrella of the things, the mediums you can be working in, um, textures and, and, what, and whatnot. So, I mean, I would just say, I mean, I would just say like getting, you know, just diving in there with hands-on medium and just trying new things. And um, I mean, it sounds like vague, but just really just also, and that would be another thing that probably co that comes into play is like looking at other artists and maybe looking at, you know, for example, there's always somebody in like in animation whose job it is to do like models, like, like clay models of the characters and for the animators to draw from. So maybe like taking a look at different artwork where um, it might be traditionally two-dimensional and how you can turn it around to three-dimensional. So that could be a great idea too, just seeing what other people are doing out there when it comes to different textures and materials. Just, I mean, working with mixed media is always a great idea and always a great way to, um, to, to, to find texture and combine different uh, different textures and, and um, colors and patterns. Um, so I would just, I mean, mostly just play and, and try new things. And certainly if you're more traditionally a two-dimensional artist, which like myself, I am as well, just allowing yourself to just play three-dimensionally and see what happens. Maybe even doing a model or like a character, again, a character or something of something you've done two dimensionally and then find like discovering or like playing with ways to bring it to life three dimensionally with all different mediums. Awesome. Thank you so much, Marin. Um, okay. The next question, I'm not sure if I understand one of the words, but maybe, but I think the context kind of describes it. Um, the question is what are the tramps to avoid in the portfolio creation process to avoid? I guess things you don't want to do. Things you don't want yeah. to do. Yeah. What do we not want to do in a portfolio? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, sure. I did mention in there master copies. Like the only time that that's really a good idea is if you're taking your, your artwork is responding to a pre-existing work. Maybe it's, yeah, it's a response or you're putting your own unique spin on it. And we have some examples of those in other portfolio tip uh, webinars, um, but you're just showing us like your iteration, like your copied uh, version of like Starry Night, Van Gogh's Starry Night isn't, it doesn't really, it's not, it kind of just takes up space in the portfolio. It's not helpful. Another thing is doing fan art. So we also, we often get a lot of like anime work, which is a beautiful art form, um, but it's so established that it's hard to make it original. So 
it's a good idea to maybe pull from anime in their compositions or colors or the gestures of the characters and make your own work again as a response or inspiration from that rather than making animation work it doesn't it's just again not going to feel original at all um what else uh we also okay if you were and again if you're applying as a first year you're not you can include work that it is directed toward a major it should overall feel like you're applying to efs or experimental foundation studies um but i mentioned that because if you're interested in architecture for example we'd rather see your again your design your architect your um whether it be interesting architectural drawings um or models um it's better that than showing like floor plans and blueprints, which are a part of the process, but they're not interesting to see. So I would, I would exclu um, exclude that. Um, another thing when it comes to your portfolio is not just what you're including, but how you're formatting it. Do not overly format your, in fact, format your slides. If you're formatting at all, it should be like, you have, if you can have maybe up to three images per slide, um, but you don't want to over clutter the slide in slide room because then we can't zoom in. It's really makes it hard to see. If you show us too many things on a slide, it's hard to see detail. It really does you a disservice. So you want to make the work, um, very legible. Um, it's shown in its best light. So we really recommend, you know, one image per slide and filling the whole slide, or again, up to three, if you'd like, sometimes people do a little, a video of like sketchbook pages or something, um, of, of different images maybe, or like a slideshow. Um, but yeah, I think those were any, what about you, Kara? Do you, am I miss any that we often speak to? I think that was really thorough. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much. It, of course, we don't want to see any plagiarism. <laughs> yes, you don't want to so, see plagiarism. Yeah. Yes, if you're if you're showing us something um, that you found on Instagram, that is another artist's work. You again, be inspired by it. That's one thing, but you can't. Like we will know. We 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 can tell if you're working on somebody else's doing something that's not yours. Um, also, if you're, we as we mentioned to you in the presentation, we strongly recommend. Um, direct observation. So don't work from a photo resource. And if you have to, or if you do some part working from a photo resource, take your own photo. Um, that way you can have more control with the angles and lighting and things like that. But certainly don't, I mean, it's, there's so much great inspiration out there. And I, and I spoke to in the presentation, different art magazines. So definitely like explore online and see what you can see, but then take, you know, your ideas and work on your ideas rather than just somebody else's. Um, oh, and I was going to say too, like other versions of fan art is like celebrity portraits. We get a lot of Timothy Chalamet, which I enjoy, but, <laughs> and they're very well done, but I'm just like, maybe, I mean, I, mean, I doubt these are direct observations. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And that actually answered perfectly the next question in line. So we can, mm -hmm. uh, go right to the next one. Um, do you have advice for getting over artist block? Ooh, that's great. Yes. And I definitely have suffered it. We all have. So it's just like looking at a blank white canvas or page in your sketchbook. I think what is helpful is one thing is like, uh, okay, blind contour, for example, that's one of my favorite things to do. Um, I talked in the presentation about taking your sketchbook around drawing people. One of the most fun things to do is not only is like drawing people at the airport, but also like trying not to like make it look like you're staring at them. So what you're gonna do is you're like, you're just gonna like, the, also the challenge for yourself is like blind contours when you're just drawing as if an ant is crawling across the page and you're not picking up your pen or your pencil. So it's all one continuous line and you're just exploring the different planes of the face or whatnot. So um, you also don't know what it looks like while you're drawing it. So you can't like self edit while you go. So it really helps to loosen, the, you know, up your creative process and get the creative juices flowing. Plus again, the added challenge of like to be looking at someone without making it look like you're looking like yeah ready to be like da, 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 da. Uh, and then you get a surprise of what it looks like when another thing my friends and I like to do we'll get on zoom or we'll have a phone call where we like we give each other like we'll have like art activities or something so maybe we'll pick like from a a, um, a couple of piles of cards and it'll it'll be like a thing 
you know, a description about that thing and an action. And then we have to illustrate that. So they're just like fun activities. And especially if it's like in a limited amount of time, because if you have a limited amount of time, then it prevents you from like overthinking. Um, another thing was my drawing teacher, while I was at RISD and illustration, it would have us do like, would list a few things, maybe like five shapes or objects. And then we'd have like 30 seconds each, comp like, or a, a minute to do as many different compositions, just like thumbnail compositions of those things. That's another way to get out of your pattern making where you're like, oh, I always tend to do something like in the foreground, in the bottom left, and then something's in the middle. And then, you know, I always tend to do the same composition. So it's like gets you out of that and like tries to like, again, you can't overthink because it's like limited time. So yeah, there's a variety of ways. And, um, but also even just like letting yourself like this, that's why the sketchbook is so great. Just letting yourself like doodle and just maybe make um, shapes with, uh, I don't know, whether it be like your coffee or something or like spilling some paint or something like that. And then using that as a starting point for whatever. So like letting that become a shape in your drawing or your painting or something, you know? So there's a lot of different ways, but, and also just know that everyone suffers artist block, even the, the greats out there. So it's totally natural, but also I think helping. And then one more thing, I think, I think just helping yourself by not putting pressure on yourself to be like, everything I make has to be portfolio worthy. Cause I certainly felt that way my senior year of high school. And I mean, art was, it was hard to have fun when I'm putting so much pressure on myself to everything's have to be like worthy of putting the portfolio. Don't do that to yourself. Allow, know that you're, you know, aiming to make work that could be in the portfolio. So you have something to choose when it's time to curate, but don't put the pressure on yourself. Of like everything has to be worthy of, of, being seen by schools I'm interested in. Just make work, see what happens. And sometimes the best stuff happens when you don't have really a ton of expectations or, you know. Amazing advice. Awesome. What about you, Kara? What do you do for for artist block? Um, I think writing is a really good method oh, for yes. art, artist block. Um, I think it's great to use your sketchbook just as much as a journal as like um as a space for your visual investigation. So mm -hmm. even if it's writing like one or two sentences of what you're observing on the street, or maybe like you see a really weird moment and you want to tell someone, but you're not with anyone, just put that in your sketchbook and then draw it sometime. I love it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I great, great advice. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, next question. And again, if you have more, please type them in. We have about mm -hmm. 15 more minutes. Um, is it okay to submit a short video of a sketchbook? Yes, absolutely. You're welcome to include videos of sketchbook, or if you have like a short film or animation, anything, there's no limit to the number of those, but we do ask that each video be three minutes or less. Um, otherwise, there's no guarantee that the reviewer will watch the entire thing. But a video of a sketchbook is great because um, we can always pause, you know, and if you wanted to take a look at a page for longer and um, yeah, and, and again, a sketchbook is a great way to, to see the way people's creative process and their brainstorming. Um, and sometimes the, the whole book in and of itself is just a work of art, the way that you really like work into it. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and what should the ratio of digital to traditional art be? That's a great question. We don't have an official number. We don't have, aside from like the 12 to 20 examples of work, we don't have a specific guideline. I personally would say at least half of the work you do should be traditional medium, but it could also be a combination of digital and traditional. I mean, or, you know, we're not going to if you, as long as you have some examples of traditional work, so you can definitely have most of your pieces be digital for sure, but it's really good to make sure that you have at least some. So we really don't have a ratio. And, and again, my suggestion of like half, at least half is, is just my personal preference, but as long as we have some really stellar pieces, even if like, you know, most of the work you show is digital, as long as we have some really stellar traditional work, that's great. Yeah. Um, well, we currently have no more questions. So I just want to encourage students again, if you have any questions, now is a perfect time to ask. Oh, great. We got another one. Uh, what do you have to say when you are writing about your work in the slides? Oh, great question. So yes, on the right of every slide, there's like a box, a text box for description. You can put the title, the size, the medium. Um, it's not required to put anything there, but we, when it comes to description, we encourage you to keep it brief, just to allow yourself the work to speak for itself. Um, 
and for more of a guarantee that the reviewer will read it, but really anything that you want the reviewer to know. And I, I do think keeping a brief is great too, because you, you know, you can speak to the process or you can speak to what it means to you, but art is so wonderful in so many ways because it's open to interpretation. So um, I wouldn't, I, I just, you're welcome to write whatever you'd like. I wouldn't over explain, but sometimes too, with the process, it's really, or the media, like it's, it's actually really insightful to have a kind of a, um, a little bit of information about how it was made or the material that you used. I don't know. What do you, what do we, what do you think, Kara? I know some people also think like, you know, that's a, what you choose to write there is a, is a, you know, important as well, but what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think you described it perfectly. I I personally think the description is most important if there's anything about your work that isn't readily known. So for instance, um, I once read an application with a student who used ground up rice particles as pigment for paint. And oh, that cool. was really important in terms of also aligning with the concept of their piece. So if you have any pieces that have, you know, you've transcended what the material is traditionally used as, or it's completely, completely unrecognizable, and it aligns with your concept, definitely put that in the description. Yeah. Um, if you have a piece, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. Maybe on the same <laughs> wavelength. So let's um, see. Well, I was going to say, if, if your description is just obvious, no need. And you, you mentioned something really important, Marin, which is you want to make sure that a reviewer reads it. We do thorough reads of all applications, but if you have a description that is a paragraph long, it's really hard for us to understand what the most important parts are always. So if mm -hmm. you have two sentences, you are showing us exactly what you want us to see, and that's more better strategy for you. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to say too, if you choose to put in work that is inspired by master copies or inspire existing work, make sure to cite the artist, make sure to cite the work. Even if your take on it is like the, you know, the, the Rembrandt you drew from is like just a launching pad and you kind of went in a springboard in like a totally different direction. It's still good to reference it. Definitely. If you, even though we, we recommend not including direct master copies, if you choose to make sure to cite the work, that's important. We will know, but cite the work anyway. And you're welcome to include some works to be like collaborative pieces. Maybe you worked on a mural or films often have a crew of a few people. Um, definitely cite the other artists. And if it's collaborative, speak to the piece, the parts of the project that was really your contribution. So it's clear. Absolutely. Um, and then the last two questions, I guess, let's, this one's a good transition. How many people review each portfolio? So about two people. So it'll be a staff member and faculty, but it could be more. Um, we have little committees. We have meetings where we come together to discuss some applications. Um, we have a few um, just in bigger, larger admissions committee meetings as well. So I would say definitely one, most of the time two, but sometimes more than that. And would you recommend getting help from a counselor to apply to RISD? Absolutely. So Kara and I are both admissions counselors. We're admissions officers, and we're here. That's our job to help you navigate the, the process. Um, many of your guidance counselors may also have some information, not just about RISD, but many other schools. Um, but I think it's certainly important to go to the source and any school you're interested in, speak to them directly to learn more about what the requirements are, um, what they're looking for the various, the differences and their, the specificities of that school's art programs. Um, and again, that's our job. We're here to help you navigate. We know how, how overwhelming it is. We know how scary it can be, and we want to help make it just easier and more enjoyable. So do your best to have fun with it too, but we are here to help like reach out by email or phone anytime or stop by in person. Absolutely. Yeah, you can. We definitely recommend you stop by for a tour. Um, we also have open house. When, when does open house usually open happen? house? Yeah, we have a couple open house days and I don't, they'll be in like October sometime. Yeah, definitely. But we'll have we have yeah, we have um, tours. And let's care of saying so definitely if you're getting or if you, you know, even if you're coming by to do a self guided tour, that's great too. But always stop by. We're happy to say hello. 
Absolutely. All right. Well, we answered all questions. And like Marin said, reach out with any additional questions that you have in the future. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Marin, for such an informative presentation. And I'll let you wrap everything up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kara, for being my chat manager and helping to answer all these incredible questions. Thank you all for your engagement and your interest. Um, and again, don't be a stranger. Please attend more of these. Check out our recordings um, and reach out if, you have, if there's anything at all we can do for you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you again.